Today's panel is Children's Rights in LGBT Families in Latin America. So as you can see, it has sort of three components. One of them is children, rights. The other one is LGBT families, and the other one is Latin America. So in families are about dependent relations, relations of dependency, where somebody is supporting someone else. And hopefully there is a, these two-way streets in families where they support each other. Okay. But uh, but what we have um, come to realize, at least, I think that that's why it's interesting about the Convention on the Rights of the Child, is that there is something valuable about protecting children. And, we've, uh, and that has been translated into this idea of uh, the principle of the best interest of the child. So we're all happy because we have this principle, the principle of the best interest of the child, and we are happy because we can always say, oh, this is in the best interest of the child. But what does it mean, the best interest of the child? It's like an empty bag. I always tell my students, you know, it's like an empty bag. We just put anything we want there. Is it possible that the best interest of the child is what I think that it's the best for my own children? Uh, there must be some standard, some sort of content that we can put into that bag. And when we say it, it's usually bullshit, because it's usually <laughs> justification for whatever we want to do. Well, what has happened then with the best interest of the child is that it has been used to discriminate against minorities, racial minorities, in minorities on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, gender as well, and class as well. So the best interest of the child sounds really well, but as long as we use it as an empty bag, it will still be a very interesting and easy way to discriminate against different individuals. Yeah. And, and the thing is, they said, well, there are these two kids that were just picked up, and they were in the compo, so they were found, and they were raised uh, you, you would have together. You'd take a plane from um, from Bogota, three hours north to Bucaramanga. Then you drive another hour and a half back south to this town called little city called San Hill, and then you take a bus from there an hour to Mogotes, which is a town that's about the biggest, as biggest it is about as big as the law school. And then you take a donkey about what was it? <laughs> like an hour, hour and a half to where they live, which didn't really have any name. You call it San Miguel, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so where they live, so he lived in a dirt, in a house with a dirt floor, and you know, just sort of no windows, this sort of thing. They had no running water, they had no electricity, and somebody had found them because they'd basically been effectively abandoned by their by their parents. So that's how they got put into uh, uh, protección, and he said they the um, you know the, the Colombian child welfare organization. The focus on of this. On, on children, the child's perspective, it makes it a completely, fundamentally different, um, and I think wonderfully different uh, intellectual framework and legal framework for doing it from the point of view of the parent. Because if you do it from the point of view of the parent, it's, well, you know, I'm, I mean, it might get, you know, I'm gay and it's a gay rights issue. Well, no, it's not, it's not a gay rights issue. I mean, there's a gay rights issue there, but you don't necessarily do adoption from that. And if you do, the, if you do it from the child's perspective, the child has a right to parents. If the parents are there, you know, the child has a right, to, and the parents are good, the child has a right to be with those parents. You have a right to keep that kid from those parents for the good of the child. And the thing is, it solves the gay issue. Because some of the parents are going to be gay. And it just wipes it out. These kids need to have parents. And you are depriving them of their rights to these parents who want to give them families, but can't because, in this case, they're homosexual. Even though we love each other very much, uh, we need a paper, because you need a paper when you need it, right? Because things work until they don't. Mm -hmm. And then you need a piece of paper. So we, when we started looking at how, how to achieve this, and um, we looked at the, the figure of second parent adoption. And uh, it was pretty strange because uh, nowhere did it mention that the second parent has to be of the opposite gender. Um, we un unwillingly became public figures. At the beginning, we did not want to. We did not want to uh, appear on TV, and if we did, if we had any opinions, if we had, I was had a bright light behind me, so my face and show my wife to just like reporters of 
they usually it was me um, talking to somebody or we we had uh, things on the radio our faces were blurred and um and then when gender happened um and Chandler, I think you will remember that the church said that giving children to homosexuals was like putting a diabetic in a candy store. And Veronica, my wife, just went to research. She said, you know, this is crazy. This is something. And they're not talking about anybody. They're talking about me. They're talking about me and they don't know me. They, some of the work was done inside the court, changing mine. But the other big part of the work was done outside. Because the media started um, following us, and they started, um, there were pictures of us in places, and they, and they said, oh, they're come on, and they said, oh, but the kids, they're so cute, <laughs> right? Um, and, and then suddenly it was no big deal. So I think that beyond um, the court, eh, as parents of same-sex couples and the, with children, we have a responsibility to live openly and to show the rest of everybody else and to engage other people so that they get to know us. Um, it is our responsibility so that we can change things. It is, I think, the best antidote to bullying because respect starts from a really young age. Respect is a habit. like one that if we want to um, have rights, we need to be visible. Um, invisible people don't have rights, and they cannot demand them. They don't exist, and they don't deserve anything from them. So being visible, being out there, we are part of the society, we exist. Uh, we are really uh, kind of sad that we are the only ones that have, uh, that, have that are out that there's more, more families like us. And there's more families that, that would really like to have this second parent adoption. And we're fighting so that it will not only be allowed for um, for biological children, but it will be um, available to all all couples that have adopted children because there's many, many couples that have adopted uh, children in, in Colombia. So change the world. <clears throat> change the world one person at a time. The change is done one person at a time, and I encourage you, you're obviously here because you care about the subject, uh, so whether you are not, whether you are or are not lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, or intersex, I encourage you to, to find as many ways as possible to be ambassadors for the subject. So for example, um, I, I have two toddler daughters, and I buy as many di diversity books that I can find to teach them that there are many different ways of being a family and that it's uh, completely okay. And I was actually really happy when I, when uh, one of the, one of my friends from my daughter's daycare had two dads. I was so, so happy. And um, and my, my daughter didn't really like the kid very much. Cause, but I was like, you know, you really, you really like this kid? No, so I push that because I like um, so, so there you have it. Um, my work has the most meaning when I get to hear people like you. Uh, we as adults have more concerns. We think that we think of um, younger generations as we would think of our own generation, and they do really see um, life with other eyes. And I'm not thinking only on sexual orientation. 